Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, mammals. This video is going over some notes that will be for NTI day number four, which is Monday, March 16th. So I left you with um, this paper for electronegativity and electron affinity, which is the last two trends that we have to talk about in this unit. Today's video is going to be covering electronegativity. Tomorrow we'll touch on electron affinity. We're going to do kind of the same procedure that we did before where we're going to look simply at what the numbers do as we go horizontally and as we go vertically before we look at what the property is really telling us and how that relates to like the root cause which is effective nuclear charge. So if you lost this paper I've posted a uh, PDF for you in Google Classroom in Google Classroom, you will also find a doc um, for you where you will answer questions 8, 9, and 10 in your words to kind of verify that you paid attention on the video today. So we'll be talking about um, those things as we go along, and it'll be your job to be able to paraphrase them back to me to show that you've sort of followed along. So once again, dive in and look at what happens to this. So when we go horizontally, you can see that for the most part, this tends to increase. So I'm going to label my arrow with increase. I don't know what happened there. Got a little screen jiggle going on. Increase. We've got some exceptions to take note of. Um, again, in the same sort of area here as before, right at the tail end of the D block. That's not going to be an exception that, again, is going to be super important to you as far as a test. What you might have noticed, though, is I don't have any values here for these noble gases. That is going to be an exception that will be important for you under to understand. And I'll spend a few minutes here towards the end of the video talking about why most of the noble gases don't have a value listed. Okay, but before we get to that, let's look at what happens vertically. As we go vertically, the values decrease. So I'll label my notes with decrease. And we've got the same sort of exceptions happening here between the fifth and the sixth row because the sixth row picks up the F block. That's not an important exception for you to know other than if you just see this data you don't get wigged out because it's not a perfect trend. So enough of the general trends and where the exceptions are kind of the same uh, familiar places. Let's go on to what this property actually measures and then relating it to effective nuclear charge. Electronegativity is the ability to attract other atoms' electrons. We're going to contrast that with effective nuclear charge, which is the attraction for that atom's own electron. So here we're talking about attracting another atom's electrons. And as you're going to see, for most cases, those go hand in hand. So if I was paraphrasing number eight, it makes a lot of sense that if you have attraction, a high amount of attraction for your own valence electrons, you're probably going to have a high amount of attraction for other valence electrons, which is why if we look at the trend, the corners where effective nuclear charge is high up here in the top right is also the same corner where electronegativity is high and the corner where effective nuclear charge is low, that they have a low attraction for their valence electrons, is also the same corner where they have low attraction for their own. Let's look at a couple diagrams and I can show this to you. So I've drawn a fluorine atom here and we will talk about, or a couple fluorine atoms, we'll talk about E and C first. So Effective nuclear charge, if you need to go back, I posted a video of our discussion about how we determine effective nuclear charge. Remember that it is the attraction from the protons when you take away 
the repulsion from the inners. So fluorine has two inners causing repulsion. So it has a pretty high effective nuclear charge because you've got all of this attraction and kind of a small amount of repulsion. So its effective nuclear charge for its own atoms is very high, which is why it's one of the smaller atoms out there because that attraction is pulling those electrons in close. Let's now compare that with fluorine's electronegativity. Which is a very long word, which I'm just going to abbreviate from here on out. Eneg for electronegativity. So now I've drawn a fluorine atom and another atom because this is the ability to attract other atoms' electrons. So lithium, on the other hand, compared to fluorine, has a very low effective nuclear charge. It only has three protons, but two inners. So small amount of attraction with kind of a significant amount of repulsion. So fluorine's high electronegativity says that it has a large ability to attract lithium's electrons towards it. So that's kind of the distinction between these two related properties. Effective nuclear charge is attraction for their own valence electrons. Electronegativity is attraction for other atoms' valence electrons. This is kind of one of my most missed questions on the matching, where you have to match the definition with the property because they're both about attracting electrons. It's just the difference of attraction for their own versus attraction for other atoms. Now, while I've got this diagram here, you might think, hey, this looks pretty similar to our Lewis dot structures for ionics. We would have drawn this, and we would have drawn that one atom being transferred over, and then we would get this ionic bond like this. And that's because electronegativity is related to whether we have ionic or covalent bonds. So what I'm talking about right now is the answer to question number nine. You know, that covalent bonds are electrons being shared, ionic bonds are electrons being transferred. In this case, I was comparing fluorine with electronegativity of four versus lithium with an electronegativity of 1. With the difference this high, fluorine has a much greater ability to attract lithium's electron than lithium has to keep it. And so we end up with a transfer of electrons and an ionic bond. So large difference. going to make us ionic. On the other hand, if we have things with a smaller difference, say carbon and oxygen, the difference between these two, oxygen is 3.5, carbon is 2.5, they're close enough in their abilities to attract other electrons that you don't have this case here where one of them is simply stealing the electron from the other. Since they're both roughly comparable in strength, they end up sharing. And so question number nine asks, for a covalent bond to form between elements, should their electronegativities be close to each other or very different? Covalent bonds are sharing electrons, so if one vastly overpowers the other, they're not going to be sharing. So the electronegativities need to be kind of similar. Lastly, here to tie this up is to go back to the exception that you are going to need to be aware of for this, and it's why do the noble gases not have electronegativities listed? So I'm going to look at a diagram here that I drew of a noble gas. 
which is neon. So neon has a high effective nuclear charge because it has 10 protons. I don't like that. Grab the highlighter instead of pen. It has 10 positive protons and it only has two inners. So it has a high attraction for its own electrons. However, if it were to attract another one, there's no room to put it in this second shell. It would have to go into a third shell, which is now going to be further out, and it's going to be putting an electron into the 3s1. This electron now sees still 10 protons, but it now sees 10 inners. So the repulsion is basically comparable to the attraction, and we just can't force neon to attract another electron towards it, because since it has to go into this outermost ring, there's no more room in the second shell, it's going to be seeing a whole lot more inner electrons than neon's normal valence electrons. So it has a very low electronegativity. So I'll summarize back up here on this chart and we'll wrap up. Just like with electronegativity, this corner of the table down here has the highest, oops, wrong, has the lowest ENC and electronegativity because they have a very weak attraction for their electrons and they would really rather lose electrons than gain electrons. This corner up here though, helium has the highest E and C, but because it's a noble gas and it has no room for an additional electrons, its electronegativity is essentially zero. So fluorine has our highest electronegativity. So that's going to be one thing that's going to be different about these last two trends is your noble gases are going to cause you a bit of a problem. Even though they have the highest effective nuclear charge, they'll have the lowest electronegativity in that row. That these guys are basically zero. And even these ones here that have values, I sort of want you to treat them like they're zero. Just because you know they have a very, they don't really want that extra electron. So, that's it for this set of notes. Um, go on to Google Classroom and you'll find a doc to paraphrase these and turn that in inside of Google Classroom. And remember, as always, take care of yourself and others, practice good hygiene, and I'll see you on the flip side.